show up some of the artists from upstairs. It's really great to see your work. And I especially want to thank Stacy Peterson for one, but also um, the entire staff and the board who are so key to putting everything together here and even recording things, I can see. Uh, and also uh, Cottingham and Butler and very generously supporting this show. So um, thanks to them. This was a pretty big project for me. I've done big projects in the past, but this one, uh, if you consider the Mississippi River and the, the length of it and all that, it's, it's, it's a little bit overwhelming. Just thinking about the, it's basically the Nile or the Amazon or the Rhine or the Ganges of uh, North America. So it's a really important river uh, for its history, but also um, in terms of commerce and, well, and I even want to back up a little bit because when we say history, there's all the pre-Columbian history, which has such a rich history still present here. And, um, and then as well, the Civil War history, which I had no idea was so key to the Civil Wars uh, being won by the North, that taking the Mississippi River was really a big thing. I didn't know that, but as I was delving into my subject, I realized there's so much to learn. And, um, you know, along with things like the wildlife corridors, the wildlife that has lived here um, throughout history, and it's 2,300 miles. And I might add, that's only one direction. I, but both directions, both sides, many seasons. So it was a lot of work. And so I approached the subject with a great deal of humility. Uh, and it, uh, but not at first, and I'll get to that in a bit. But it really is a personal journey. journey. It's not a uh, guidebook. I mean, these aren't, um, they aren't, uh, I, when I was initially thinking of the show, I thought I would go every 50 miles and, you know, catch something of it. Because I didn't, how do you encapsulate uh, 2,300 miles of landscape. How exactly do you approach that? So I decided, rather than do that, to um, just approach it as who I am, a painter, a 21st century painter, and what I find intriguing to paint. Um, and one of the good things about this long journey is that I was basically raised to be an incorrigible traveler. Inadvertently, I believe. My parents at age, when I was, well, my parents weren't age six, I was age six, and they um, started, oh, I think they were inspired by television ads in the 60s, go out and discover the new highway system, which is kind of funny now. I, you discover it by sitting in, in traffic in Chicago. That's, like, <laughs> that's the way they, uh, most of us discover it today, but back then they were encouraging people to see America and to go out and use the highway system. My parents took it pretty much to heart, and they uh, they would um, chase around, see how many of us they could uh, round up. There were 11 kids, so um, they couldn't put us all into the car, but as many as they could shoehorn in, we'd get in and start driving. My dad was had these long vacations of six weeks, and so we'd go across the country either direction, and um, starting up from Minneapolis, which is where I'm from, and we um, explored the world. And I was, it was fascinating. It was a great eye-opening experience for a kid. And one of the things that, um, that I particularly remembered out of that, I mean, it, there were so many things, the national parks, just seeing the country from so many different perspectives uh, was pretty amazing. But um, about our third trip, I was a paper boy. And so I was able to save up tons of cash. And I bought my own. Uh, Instamatic little camera. I thought, uh, as I go on this trip next time, I'm going to be like my dad. I'm going to take photographs. And my gosh, I think I went through two rolls of film before we crossed the border into Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> it was pouring rain all time, and so and it was the middle of summer, so it was all green. And when I got it back, Instamatic cameras are set. I think uh, a thirtieth of a second or something. But we're driving. And I'm, you know, look at that. So it was just one, I got one continuous piece of film that was all green blur. And I, it kind of freaked me out because I knew what I'd seen. And it was so exciting, that rain and the green, but it didn't really show up in the photograph. So for me, I knew I, if I, it was a good basis from which to assess visual, visual imagery for me. Because I, a photograph can't, they're upstairs. They're amazing photographs. It, really capture something amazing that uh, I couldn't do as, as a 12-year-old. I don't know why, but it was uh, an eye-opener. I realized that art can bring something else to 
photography or painting or whatever, but to uh, re reassess what you've seen and what's before you and what you experience. Anyway, that big party of traveling around the country for several weeks out of the year ended when I was about 18 or 16 or something. My parents, I can't remember what happened. They stopped going or I stopped going, but I still was kind of addicted to the idea. So when I turned 18, um, started off in college to study art, and um, I got most of the way through that year, and then I decided that, hey, isn't it about time I had another trip? So I, um, you know, I was used to just hitching a ride with my parents, so I decided to start hopping freight trains to get across the country. And so I wound up on the West Coast and up in Alaska and all around for, basically from the time I was 19 to 26, I was doing that, studying in between sometimes, but it was, you know, learning a lot of being out there on the, the big wild highway. And um, uh, one of the things that, well, there's so many things that happened, I could actually, I was hoping to write a book one day, so sign up for my email uh, <laughs> newsletter and I'll let you know when that happens. But in the meantime, I'm painting. But at the time, um, those vagabonding years, there were so many things to experience. And one of the things visually that, I mean, the West is always a great place to go, so open and all that. But riding in a freight train is really one of the very best ways to go. I recommend it to you all. <laughs> it's, as you go, it's, you're, you're cruising along very fast off, and not always, which is kind of nice, you have to go slowly as well. But if you're in a box car, you, you, see, the, you see the landscape frame with this giant frame. And it's like, it occurred to me just the other day that um, if you know anything about the history of the Mississippi River and how it was, it was a big deal in the 1800s. Uh, there was a, a man named John Banvard who made a cycle or a panoramic painting would roll up and like scroll. And it would, it was like a quarter mile long, literally a painting, I think it was probably 10 feet high, maybe more. I, I don't remember the dimensions, but they always bragged about being one mile long. And then somebody else would come up with a five mile long one. It, estimates are that it was really only about half a mile long, but it was basically the course of the Mississippi River from top to bottom, basically what I'm doing. But they, like a stage scene set, they painted them fairly quickly and moved along and they'd scroll them in front of an audience like yourself. And um, anyway, that's what the freight train seemed to me, watching everything go by like a panorama that I, wasn't decided. The train took me where I wanted to. And uh, that was kind of the fun of it all. Uh, so, John Banvard. This is a bit like John Banvard's work in the sense that I, I went from top to bottom of the river, but um, of course I, I was a little, um, well, these are more like still scenes. This was more like a movie. And um, eventually, just uh, I was at Bemidji State University when I was finishing up my train hopping career, and um, I was about uh, well, I was about 26, I guess, and and I got a BFA in painting, and then went on to Southern Illinois University. Uh, Bemidji is on the Mississippi River, and um, so is Southern Illinois University, pretty much. So. I've lived in five different places along the river, so it's always been kind of part of me, even though I live now in the west, east, you're in the west compared to where I live, but they, uh, the, um, I live on a tributary of the Mississippi River, so I'm still kind of there. We all live in this big basin that encompasses 31 states and drains, it drains uh, part of at least 31 states, and, um, it's a very important part of America, as I stated in so many ways. But uh, yes, oh, I wanted to know. I mean, I wanted. To, I know what I wanted to say about <laughs> studying for an MFA. I also did a lot of art history, which I find very key to understanding not only um, why anybody paints or does any kind of artwork, but also to see how we see things. I mean things 100 years ago, you couldn't walk into a show like upstairs and see the things that you just tacitly can see because of the culture that we live in. So understanding our history gives us a key to that, and I, I find it fascinating. And it's not only that, but it's even 
what we can see in that sense. Well, after graduate school, I came very close to getting a couple of jobs. I was a finalist for two teaching positions, and thankfully they didn't hire me. I wasn't sure what I was going to do, but I realized I had some time off, what to do. So I decided to go on a trip. Surprise, surprise. I uh, went on a bike trip this time, and I went for a couple months. But in the meantime, all my graduate painting work was still what I do with this. So I brought it to a gallery in my home state of, uh, hometown of Minneapolis and dropped it off. I talked to the gallery director at a couple places, and uh, I said, look, I'm just here today. I'm leaving for six weeks. If you want these, take them. And they did. Um, and so when I got back, I was a little shy about coming back to the gallery because I wouldn't know where I was going to put them now. And they told me when I showed up that they were, where have you been? We couldn't contact you. We didn't even know where you were. But people bought your work, and uh, you have more. And I realized, oh, maybe I could be a painter, which was always the dream to be. But there's no sure way forward with that. It's uh, just, um, but ever since then, it's been just kind of, I've uh, been on that freight train for 30 years now, doing that. It wasn't ever as, I never decided to be an artist as a, a wise business decision, but, or that I could afford it really, but um, because I just felt that it would be the best use of my life. That's just, um, you know, I looked around and thought, well, what else? I mean, when I was, Traveling around, I, uh, I met these guys on their way to Alaska. They picked me up hitchhiking, and um, they had uh, there's some stories in there. I was telling my wife last night, I'm not going to get into it. <laughs> kind of a wild ride up in Alaska. But, um, they, were, they, had, um, they were moving up there because one of them had, uh, he was an airplane mechanic, and if you know anything about uh, Alaska, everybody's got, a, they don't have cars, they have planes, and so he was, you know, guaranteed employment up there. And another guy, his brother actually was um, a, uh, a mason. So they had these trades and they, they said, yeah, I've got some advice for you. Get a trade and then you can go anywhere you want. And being an inveterate traveler, I, I, I realized that would be a fun thing. So I, I went to trade school too. And so I can, I can paint, I, I, can, I can weld standing on my head. I can't paint standing on my head. That's reserved for that guy in the room. Uh, you know, yeah. Michelangelo, but uh, <laughs> so I know I have some notes here. Randomly. Ah. Oh, yeah, there's the show. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, this is, uh, I'm going to talk about the show now. The, where did this come about? Uh, it, it actually had an interesting um, uh, initiation story, whatever. It, it, um, why would anybody paint the entire Mississippi River? It is a long way to go. So many different things on it. How do you encapsulate it anyway? And what kind of idiot would do this? Take this out. Well, it's me. I, um, I, but I didn't start out that way. I kind of slipped into it because initially, well, I've done this big project of painting wilderness areas all around the country. I've, I've gone to 39 states and painted wilderness, federally designated wilderness in all these different uh, states. and had a show that traveled to a few museums. And uh, when I found out that the, that was to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Wilderness Act. Uh, when the centennial of the national park system came up, everybody turned to me and said, so what are you going to do? And I hadn't really thought about it much. I was just, you know, still wiping my brow from the last show. But um, they, they kind of got something going in my mind because I've been Artists in residence at um, three national parks, Yosemite, Rocky Mountain National Park, and Acadia National Park, so West Coast, Rocky Mountains, and then the East Coast. And I thought, well, you know, I should do something because it's a very great organization. It's a great aspect of our country. We actually came up with the idea. Well, actually, it was Henry David Thoreau, I think, first proposed a national park. But um, our national parks were the first in the, in the world to be established. Um, so I called the Centennial Office of the National Park System in Washington, D.C. and I said, look, next year is the uh, Centennial. What, what would you like me to do? Is there any ideas you have? Because I've you know, i been an artist in residence in these parks. And I told them which ones, and they laughed. They said, don't even bother. There's so many artists. There's so many things going on with that kind of stuff. 
it's overdone. And I realize this from living in Maine that everybody paints the coast. And when I lived in Maine for 10 years, I would be inland painting the beautiful mountains there because there's so much more to Maine than just the coast. And I, so I knew that. I said, well, look, um, why don't you come up with three parts? Oh, they said, we'd rather that you focus on parks that people really need to see that are underestimated or brand new and they really uh, should have more attention. You're doing a show, you know, about that. So I said, great, why don't you come up with three national parks that I should focus on and I'll pick one. And, and I told them my criteria. I said, one of them was that there would be uh, a, a city nearby so that I could, you know, have people come to the show if I did a show in a museum there or whatever. I didn't, it was just an incipient, or it was just at the beginning of the whole idea. And I thought that it would be a good idea to kind of work that into it. Anyway, they came up with, uh, Santa Monica Mountains, which is just outside of LA. It's a new uh, park designation there, a beautiful area by Malibu, basically. And I thought, well, that's great. And I've been um, talking with them. Uh, they were, I spoke with all three of them at the same time that they came up with. And they were proposing the idea that, oh, if you come out here and do this, we'll, um, we'll take one of your paintings and translate it into roses. We'll put it in a parade or a float for the Rose Bowl. Uh, well, that's really weird. <laughs> okay. And then there's one called uh, Vallas Caldera out of, outside of uh, Santa Fe, which is a big um, caldera of a, a huge volcano down there. And um, it's, it's a new park designation, beautiful area, and it's near Santa Fe, which is uh, one of the art capitals of, uh, of Western art for sure in um, North America, in America. And I thought, oh, that's, that's pretty cool. Then they named the one. They said, Mississippi National River and Recreation Area. I said, oh, okay. That sounds interesting. I used to live on the Mississippi. Is that in Memphis or Dubuque? Or uh, where is this place? Because like, I figured it'd be down where the, the river gets completely major. And they said, no, actually, it's in Minneapolis, St. Paul. <laughs> what do you mean it's in Minneapolis, St. Paul? They said, well, there's a 72-mile corridor that the National Park Service controls, basically, throughout, um, you know, from either side of Minneapolis and St. Paul, designated as a national park system thing. I have two people from Minneapolis here. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah, well, I know. I was totally shocked. I spent our time on box cars. I know. I was born in the middle of this national park, and I didn't know it. So very strange. And uh, so I decided that's a good idea. I'll do that one because it definitely needs to be have more exposure, right? So I um, and I have a, a gallery there. So I thought, okay, I'll do a show, work with the national park system, and that's what we did. We had a show um, at the Groveland Art Gallery, and um, it was it was a, it was a neat little show. And I thought, well, maybe the Minnesota Marine Art Museum on the Mississippi River would be interested in showing these works because it's all about water in Minnesota, and um, they they cut, they like the idea, but we were on the phone a little bit too long because before we got off the phone, I was saying, you know what, I'm going to paint the whole river, and then he got off the phone right away after saying, yeah, okay, what did I just agree to? And um, I sobered up. <laughs> but it was um, but it was the beginning of this, and I talked to a couple other uh, museums, including this one, and we were able to put together a traveling show that um, is for you here to see as well as it had been up at um, Minnesota Marine Art Museum. And thank you. There are some people that came down here that had seen the show up there, so seeing it for their second time wherever you are. I've met a few people today that have done that. So. Um, Anyway, again to the show. I just want to say at the outset, bro, we're most of the way through with my talk. <laughs> but I have books for sale, and in the books, as well as on the wall, actually, there, there's, uh, it explains, it kind of encapsulates a lot of what I experienced that made me inspired to do each of these paintings. So I'm not really going to go through and talk about each painting. I'm going to talk about, um, actually, this painting and the one at the end of the show. Um, specifically, but really, that's all in the book or on the wall. So if you have any questions, you can definitely ask me, but 
um, just know that they're also talked about in the book. And um, all right. So, well, so we've got this show all set up, and then really all I had to do was just all the work. <laughs> <laughs> the challenge for me, though, is that I'm kind of done, I've done a lot of work with the Nature Conservancy and people like that, that organizations like that, National Park System, and so I'm used to painting just nature because I've, there's something uh, that I find completely inspiring about. Uh, it, it, you don't want me to go with this, it's too much talking. But it's, I would, uh, there's something that I feel like I'm channeling through nature into my work or that I get inspired by. And I can't really explain that in very tersely right here. But suffice to say that I knew that if I'm painting the Mississippi River, there's a lot more to it than just trees. And I was actually a little bit worried, and I was almost going to cancel the whole show after I agreed to do it early, early on. Don't worry, don't worry, Steve. But um, <laughs> that, because uh, it's already here, you don't have to worry. Uh, that I would be painting just another curve in the river, a bend in the river with more trees. And I thought that, you know, this is, I don't want to bore anybody, let alone myself. So I, I wasn't sure whether it would be actually a task that I would uh, uh, be able to or even want to master because I was so much about painting raw nature, basically. But um, I decided to, again, just see what I could find along the river that um, was interesting for me as a 21st century painter to paint as an observational painter. Uh, and there was a lot to see. There was 2,300 miles of it on both sides, as I said. And I went in all seasons. And so I was going from areas where moose would be common to alligators, and then, you know, bayou to boreal forest. And, and um, you know, both shores, it's interesting because it divides so many states. There's often a, a more major city on one side, like here, and then on the other side, well, you know, just nature. I mean, the painting of the bridge here in town shows the bridge coming right into downtown Dubuque, and then we're really looking across to the other side. There's there's all my trees that I like to paint so much, but you'll see that along um, along the river often down by Memphis and many places. So it was actually uh, quite a bit of variety, and that actually gets to something I want to kind of get into too, because. A lot of times my work will move, actually this is a good example of these two, but this one has a lot of impasto paint and it's, it's uh, rather inventive in how the forms are um, interpreted rather than just directly, they're not photographic, let's just put it that way. Whereas a lot of my other paintings could be, um, well again, I, things are more expressive than a photograph I guess in many ways, but um, the, the depth of the paint for instance, often changes. And there are some paintings that aren't in this iteration of the show, but that have um, needed to, to be kind of, I had some lettering in some. And it really, if that was important to the uh, impetus for the painting, I really had to go somewhere else other than just, you know, having the paint be, ha having the painting be about painting, which is really what that one tends to be about. And, um, so each painting, kind of like, uh, I've been lucky enough, and I assume most of us have probably seen this, but it's a really cool thing to see when um, you see the beginning of ice forming on glass. It'll just start taking off. And you can watch it go, you know, just growing. And that's basically how these happen. I'll start, and I'm not sure if they're going to turn out, you know, with every line uh, portrayed or if they're going to have you know a lot more information just in paint or what but because they just they grow and I, I don't control that I kind of watch it happen and sometimes just scrape it off and start over again which is the nature of the beast but um, yeah I do want to mention balance yeah so there were so many different things but probably the biggest contrast was going from the first painting uh, or I should say the first, the beginning of the river to the very end, which is, uh, maybe, is there an open book around somewhere? I think I have. Is that one? Okay. The 
final painting of the shows, well, starting here, how many people have been to the beginning of the Mississippi River? There's usually a crowd that, oh, I saw all you people there. What am I talking about? <laughs> There's usually a crowd. They're all trying to get across the river. Because you can walk across over here. There's Lake Itasca, and you jump across these rocks. And I don't know how many. It took me a while to figure it out. But they're all they're all actually set in concrete. Did you know that? <laughs> yeah. It's not so natural. <laughs> in fact, it was a slew to begin with. They actually had to narrow it. Down. They actually dredged it out, I think, a bit. But anyway, they created the river right there. Otherwise, it would have been just a nebulous flow coming out of the river. Anyway, it's a popular spot for especially kids to clamber across. So how far is it from one side to the other in real life? 30 feet? feet? Yeah. Oh, is it all over? Yeah, it's about from me to Stacy. Is it all built up with buildings and parking lots and everything there? No. no. It's a state park. Yeah, it's very well preserved. There are some very old uh, red pines there. And, uh, red pines. They get there by a boat. It's, pardon me? They get there by a boat to that, right? Well, have a, good, have a good time crossing that. But yeah, you couldn't go up the river and cross that into it. But the boat itself, I mean, being on the, that's a big lake. Itasca is huge. And you could be out there on a the boat. Um, yeah. Anyway, but but it's a very small. There's another painting around the corner of two people um, that I've met here. It's a, a very young couple. They were um, we happened to be walking down the path together, and I, we just said hello and spoke for a while. And then um, they decided they wanted to walk the river, where I split off to go over on a little bridge, and I had my camera with me, and I, I shot a picture of them, and that's where that that came from those people. And I just thought it was, it kind of was um, emblematic of the beginning of anything, the beginning of a river, the beginning of a relationship. Nobody knows where it's going to go. And, and so I, I just thought I really had to paint that. And I, I wonder if they'll recognize themselves from the back. I have no idea who they are, but hopefully they'll see that painting someday and recognize themselves. But, um, so this, but this one, you could walk across the river. And at the very end of the river, I mean, here, of course, we need these big steel structures. It's a very big deal to be able to cross the river. The, um, the railroads were the first to build across in St. Louis. The Eads Bridge, which is an amazing structure, still there. I think that was, was that Grand Yeah. I've read so many books, I'm kind of forgetting the, um, but anyway, the railroads were a huge threat to the uh, river traffic. And so you could get this traffic going straight across the river once you build a bridge. But other than that, you had ferries and things like that that really slowed things down. And uh, the river traffic was very um, threatened by this. Anyway, I'm sidetracking. What I want to get to is at the very end of the river, there's no bridges over it. It's about, uh, I'm guessing, 150 miles across is the delta. And I wanted to have the same experience as I had walking here. And the only way that occurred to me to do that would be to get off on a plane and fly across it. It took a lot longer to fly across it to walk, I'll tell you that. And it was, um, so that's the final painting here, um, which is kind of, I guess, without having to go in the other room. Well, I can show that to you, and you can reference it when you go in. Mm -hmm. But this painting here called um, Palimpsest was, um, I wasn't prepared for it, because I didn't know. You know, we all have seen uh, the Delta, what it looks like from uh, our maps. You know, there's this nice lobes of land where the river dumps out all that stuff. It doesn't do that anymore. We have so, um, I want to say canal, but we've dredged out a canal, basically, um, a waterway for the barges to go up in all the shipping traffic, shipping lanes, right into New Orleans. Rather than going through this swamp, they've had to keep it clean, but with, by doing that, they straighten the river, made all the sediment just go getting dumped straight out into the Gulf of Mexico. Or they dredge it up here, but either way, it doesn't make it into the delta. So what's been happening is what used to come out there and just start spreading out and building up the land has stopped for 100 years or whatever of our controlling it. And um, it's had this effect where the land is literally sinking. And um, it's a very sad thing because New Orleans, we know what happens when uh, we do that because New Orleans has no buffer anymore. When they get hit by 
a hurricane, they get hit by a hurricane because before there would be this buffer zone that would uh, absorb all of the um, impact of the water sweeping in and uh, take the brunt of the storm. So I wanted to mention a couple of surprises that I had along the way. It was uh, One of them was the, um, well, I guess the length of the river that was covered with levees. I, I had no idea that they even start right here. You have levees here that they go further north in the bluff country and they don't really do that much, like around Winnell and or anything like that. But down south, that's all they have. And so to see the river, you definitely you have to go up. So I'd be driving along the river and every so often I'd you know, get out of the car and go up the hill and see what's going on. Well, the barges and all that kind of thing. Very interesting. Um, but you'd see these towns that have been established for you know, 100, 150 years or more on the river uh, with this big hill right there. So they, but unlike the Butte, where you can actually go down to the river, many other places are just cut off from the river. It's just a little um, berg, and then the river's up there, basically. And I, I found that really interesting for, from somebody who grew up in the northern part of the river and really had never uh, experienced such a continuous length of that. And then um, I guess I was kind of reading about, when I was reading about the Civil War and the importance of Cairo, Cairo, sorry. Is anybody from Cairo here? Has anybody ever been to Cairo, Illinois? Yes, Southern Illinois. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting town. It's, it feels like a ghost town if you go there now. I don't know how long it's felt that way, but it's such an I mean, it's at the confluence of the Ohio River, which is, dumps in more water than actually the Mississippi has at that point. And so it's this great intersection. And they've, at the Civil War, they were thinking, if we could only take that, whoever controlled that would control everything, because they have all the upriver, downriver. It's a great spot, but the floods that would come there would just wipe the town out continually. So you, you can see the remnants of a city that never really took off very well. And it's very, it's worth the trip just to see, I think. But it's an um, interesting place. And then, oh, I don't know, I walk in, well, I have a bunch more notes. I'm not gonna go into it, but I, I wanna say that one of the things that I early read about was, um, I guess in the mid 18th or 17th century, I mean 18th century, people were already talking about the Mississippi River as being a terrible neighbor. And I guess we're seeing right now why that would be called that. And um, there's a mighty power in it. And the humility that we need to have in the face of uh, such a power, I think, is very important. And I think it's true of all nature. But um, and it's uh, really sad how our lives can be affected negatively by that. But in the meantime, it's, it's an amazing thing that we will never ultimately control the Mississippi River. I don't really have anything else much to say except for another 10 pages. I'm not going to go on. But if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Do you do most of your painting from photographs then? If you're such a, you're a good photographer and then you bought Yeah, I forgot to bring in. I, I also do these little gouaches that. I think I have a book here. Do you have Guash's book? Um, yeah, on site I do little gouache. I used to do plain air landscape painting, but I realized I'm really bad at that because I spend months and sometimes years in the studio on painting and just reworking it. So even my little, I do these, they're watercolor gouache. Watercolors basically, they're only that day. Gouache is just a fancy name for um, an opaque watercolor. It's not here? Okay. Um, yeah, they're, they're just, they're really small paint. Actually, somebody upstairs did some gouache paintings, didn't they? Yeah, or, I think they were the little spacemen. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit like actually poster colors, what we would most be familiar with in a sense. <coughs> it's a fine art medium now. I mean, it's really permanent colors and all that sort of thing. It's fun to work with. But I do those on site. I take photographs because, you know, with, well, I've never figured out how many miles I've done up and down the river and back and forth. And, you know, it's 800 miles just to get to the river for me. So, um, um, you know, and you never know what you're going to miss by moving on. So I never, I don't consider myself a plein air painter. 
sort of answer your question, I take photographs, I do drawings, but mostly, um, you know, this is not a photograph, for instance, it's uh, works that come from experience. Yes? It was kind of a deja vu moment because when we moved into this building about 20 years ago, we had, uh, you know, an origin to mouth uh, exhibition and, and the names escaping now. We own two of his paintings and one is actually at Cotton Butler at all places. Um, did you know him? I think he was a professor at Southern Illinois too. Uh, you know him? Um, he's at Yeah, Illinois State. Oh, Illinois State. Or what did say? Um, oh, at the Butler Collection? No, but uh, what was his name? James Butler? James, James Butler. Yeah. 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 You know him? Yeah, I don't know him personally, but I know him. Is that what's over at the building? Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. The huge. That's a okay. Yeah, so it's, I didn't realize. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> After capturing the character of Mississippi in so many places, what is the character that just comes through to you? You know, how do, how do you see Mississippi? How do I see? Or are, are the people alive? Or what? I see what Mississippi. When I think of Mississippi, I think of that pie shop in uh, Bellevue. <laughs> But, and that actually that's that's emblematic as well and things change I mean you know I was there on the first day this pie shop opened in Bellevue it just happened and, and actually it's a kind of a cool start because I walk in I didn't know it was their first day they have the newspaper clipping of them opening up on the window that I didn't notice when I came in all I could see was a pie and I was picking up pie and, um, and there was a woman and her three kids and they're all like watching me go through <laughs> picked up this and they're like amazed because here's a, a guy selecting one of their mom's pies and then and then handing their mom money for it. <laughs> so anyway, I look forward to coming back to that pie shop and it's gone. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, that and that actually for me emphasizes that, you know, what do they say? You can never step in the same river twice. So it's a little bit of that essence. And so and I've, again, lived in five places along the river. So I have so many fractured ideas of what the, the, um, the whole river is that I can't encapsulate it in one thing. It's a, it's a living baby. Yeah. Ask another question. So here's your other beautiful pictures of the river that, I've seen, that I remember when I'm doing the room. But I know my nephew's right now working on the big oil spills in the Houston area. And so did you have ugly pictures oh. along the river? Thank you for saying that. I, I, have, I have an answer for that here. <laughs> no, there was actually something I thought was really important to say, and um, I don't know how it got lost, but actually it's the idea that as we, I'm just, I'm just doing this for show. I'm trying to make it up as we go along. That, it's extremely important. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to almost read it because I don't know if it's in my head very well. But it's extremely important to see clearly and fight against the ugliness of injustice. You know, to see it clearly as though you could paint it. And there are people who paint that of injustices and poisons of all sorts. Um, but that it's equally important to um, see and celebrate the beauty in the world. So that's what I feel I bring to this. Is like, Because actually that's what we fight for. We fight against the other thing. And that's a job for somebody else to do. That's what the newspapers are for, and some artists or whatever, but definitely. And I do have, in the book, um, I have to show you this painting. It's not on the show. What we curated for here, it's, it's uh, smaller than all the works that were put together, but what Stacy and I came up with were ones that showed the river itself. And um, there's one in particular that I'm going to find right here. And this is, oh, yes, I want to say one thing else before I, well, I'll say it in a second. But this one is a nuclear power plant. So, but I painted it with a pink sky. Isn't that nice? um, yeah, I mean, I like to, and you know, the smokestack, somebody was saying yesterday, I really like that painting, but can you paint out the smokestack? No, this is, this is our world. And actually, it's, um, I think it helps the composition. But, uh, but I want to say this about, Let's see if I can do it here. This painting is one of the first ones. So I, because the surfaces are also very different, I decided to have a 10 inch square from the painting reproduced in the book for some of the bigger paintings so that when you hold it up, it should actually match 
Uh, pretty much precisely. So, you know, if I cut that out and put it up there, probably you might not notice the difference. So, so I have several that look like that. Yes? How long did this whole project take? take you with all the travel and then the painting? It was a three-year project to get it to the first museum. So um, I haven't seen it. I was worried that people were going to ask me titles of paintings because it's been a while since I've seen some of them in certain ways. And, um, but it was three years in the, in the works. So um, from uh, 2015. And actually, um, for those people from Minneapolis who might be here, uh, do you know the Camden Bridge? Did you notice the little Camden Bridge painting over here? Oh, it's just it's a little one right around the corner, but um, that was one of the first ones for it specifically for the show. And actually, I was interested in painting more of the gritty side of of, um, of the river. But I again found myself drawn to some of the, the grand views and the vistas around here are beautiful um, near well Palisades and further up the river at, I'm forgetting the names of them all, but um, Pikes Peak and things like that. Gorgeous. Yeah. Yes? I'm, I'm in love with that painting. And I just wondered what you really, what I used some new channel thing, so I, I, I stuck on that. But you did want to talk about it more, but that's really interesting <laughs> oh, to me. Oh, thanks. That, um, so I just wondered what the, what the little gouache looked like and what the photo looked like and what uh, compared to that, I mean that is just well, majestic. I, have to tell majestic. You, um, I don't know if you saw majestic, but I mean that's a very majestic. I don't know if you <coughs> what you actually saw. Well, I don't know if that word exactly would be. I'm not sure what. Yeah, I, I'm not a poet, so well, I'll come up with it's the not word. the right word, but that's the word. Yeah, I um, have to say something. You definitely want to bring across a sort of. It's kind of the birth of the river, so it's like this. Um, uh, portentous, I guess. You know, something that talked about things to come. Uh, kind of, you know, I, I'm not sure. That's why I had to paint it. I had to show so that. So that was the time of day you were there with the. You know, it was early morning. Yeah. And it definitely is a lot of invented things about that painting. And actually, I. Yeah. You know, I used to go camping on lakes in northern Minnesota in the middle of the winter. I mean, literally on the lake, because you can, you know, even have a fire on the lake up there because the, the ice gets so thick. So uh, friends and I just go out camping. This is my, um, what I wanted to experience of Lake Itasca. And um, that, well, I was there in the daytime. But my memory of it, my feeling of, I'd actually been to the park at night before with friends in the middle of the winter. and. That's what I wanted to bring this. I had no reference but my brain. And so um, that was, so the experience of being on the river in these different places is what comes through. And that's what I'm trying to make my trip. So did you travel up and down the river on boats? Or did you use cars and then just go out the river? Yeah. I didn't go out the river very much. Well, at all, really. I was um, set up to, well, it was, in the planning stages, we have uh, my wife and I have some friends who are really good friends with a lawyer for this huge barge company down in Memphis. And I was, they were going to put me on a barge, but I was afraid I'd wind up in China. So uh, I, I didn't do that. But I, I've flown over, I've driven over all the bridges up and down. I think I might have missed one or two. And I have to say, most of them are in Minnesota. They're about 10 feet across up in northern, way northern. Um, there are a lot of little, you just cross over the Mississippi like there's a puddle up there by Bemidji, as Tim would know, right? I mean, there, I don't know, maybe you don't know, but, but the river goes north and it goes, uh, it meanders all over the place, goes through people's um, farmlands, and you know, just to get around there, you're doing all these zigzagging to try to find the river. You wind up crossing it many times, and it's basically, I wouldn't say a culvert exactly, but it's a small river for a long way, and, and gorgeous up there, too. Yes, thank um, Did you network with any other artists like James Butler before you did this? Because I wonder 
And you know how many artists have done Mississippi? How big this oh, there had to be others that did it. I mean, John Van Bard has been dead for 150 years. No, there are, I'm sure there are lots of, since then, that I've met more people who have been um, somehow like canoeing the entire length or, um, you know, things like that. But not, not people who've dug, painted the whole river. No. I'm sure that um, it, it's been done. Everything's been done. But the fascinating thing about the river's history and even knowing where it begins or ends, it was always difficult. They knew there's this giant river in the middle of the country. And they couldn't figure out where in the delta. They, you couldn't just go up the river and find your way up here. They couldn't figure out where the main channel was. And so they had to come in from the north. That's where most of the exploring was. But they wasn't, weren't sure to where. It was a mess. And it was very interesting to figure out where the beginning of the river was. And they arbitrarily misnamed it for about 100 years. It was uh, uh, the School of Craft River, so-called now, was what they thought was the beginning of the river up there. And, and they, they began it in Cass Lake for a while. They thought that was the end of it. But Cass Lake goes into Lake Bemidji, and then Lake Irvine, and then you know, out, out to Lake Itasca. So it's just, it's just a big uh, mystery. And that, yeah, so other artists that have done it, I know there had to be people who tackled it, but um, the best advice I'd have for them is to live on the river and spend their whole life doing it, because it's a lot of, a lot to paint. Yes? Um, the brochure mentions um, Judith Curtis, who wrote the essay in your book. Yeah. Can you just say a bit about her? Oh, she's, um, she writes for a publication called um, American Art Review. Oh, and it's, um, it's typically articles having to do with um, museum shows around. It's unlike Art America or things like that. It's a different kind of, it's more of a scholarly sort of thing. She's the director of, or is she curator and director, possibly both, of, of a museum in Gloucester, Massachusetts, which is a fishing village well-renowned for its um, painting colony. And so they have this great collection of artists who've worked there for 100 years and uh, is still pretty vibrant. A lot of plein air artists go there and a lot of galleries, I think. I, I, I think I was there once before, but yeah. So that's that's her. She's an art historian. Yeah. Thomas, does being a native of Minnesota give you an advantage over other people, whether they're artists or photographers who are not from the area who somehow end up working in that area. You're talking to a person like me, for example. I was born and raised in the Chicago area, yet for the past 10 years, I've been taking my cameras all over the Driftless area, trying to identify, like you, little scenes and trying to paint a picture or tell a story with my you know, equipment. So what do well, you say about yeah. that? I'm, thank you for reminding me of that, because that's actually true. I mean, reminding me that you told me that you do that photography and come over. So I was going to say right off the bat, absolutely not. I mean, being sometimes you get blinded to something that you're too close to. Mm -hmm. So you don't, I mean, you might find that a photographer that goes from the hinterlands of Iowa to Chicago and shoots the street scenes might open your eyes to things you didn't even pay any attention to. I imagine that's a pretty easy thing to think of. Yes. So absolutely not. I think that... Um, the main thing is to be able to be aware, and when, once you get behind your camera, you're showing things to people that they might not have seen or overlooked. Mm -hmm. um, I was once painting plein air down in the south, uh, south of France in a little tiny town where Matisse and um, my favorite painter, whatever his name is. <laughs> no, not Cezanne. No, I think uh, Durant, Andre Durant, one of the other folk painters, but. They, you know, like Italy and Spain, the south of France has their long siesta. So, but I painted right through, and there was there happened to be uh, shooting uh, news channel five on Paris was down there to do a story about um, painting today in Collier, and because this is the town they love to go to and paint, and uh, they just wanted to see because they heard all these painters would be there and. Um, well, I was the only painter still painting, <laughs> so I got interviewed. I barely speak any French. I say, "Croissant." <laughs> and, 
they still, you know, interviewed me, and, and then all the other artists woke up two hours later, and, and then they saw the news the next day. The film crew got this guy, not us, and they were so mad. But you know, I might have brought things that they might not have seen. You know, and the important thing. Oh, speaking of Edward Hopper upstairs, um, Edward Hopper had this thing that really stuck with me when I heard about it. Um, I was in Bemidji for studying art history. I don't remember under what context, but I remember from back then. Um, Hopper said something to the effect of, I want to make paintings that make you feel like you're traveling. Or he said something about that feeling when you're traveling. And it's a great thing. It's a great exercise. When you're in your hometown, close your eyes while you're driving, <laughs> and then open them up and see it as somebody might see it driving in for the first time. And it's really hard to get to that point. But that's where your new experience is more valuable in many ways than somebody who's lived there all their lives and has an intimacy that you can't even imagine. But on the other hand, you're showing them things. You know, it's all, it's all about communications. It's all about um, people showing each other and sharing. So. And then, Thomas, one other question. I know we don't have much time, but most of what you've done is a pretty much a lands landscape view of what you're trying to get your point across. Your uh, painting of a little slice of the Julian Dubuque Bridge kind of like is a little different stylistically. Mm -hmm. So in order to do that particular work, I imagine you ha you've, been tra you've trained yourself to uh, look for not just the big picture, but you're looking for smaller parts within the big picture to try to tell a story. And that's something I've tried to do the last five, seven years because I've seen mm -hmm. a general view of uh, lots of places where I've been to, but now I'm kind of focusing on smaller views with the hopes of trying to discover new ways of telling stories or telling stories that that didn't occur to me the first time. Yeah, there's a word that I'm trying to think of that uh, 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 I was thinking of Schenectady instead, but um, Ellen, what's the word? But Synecdoche. No. Synecdoche. Uh, yes, because yeah. I can't, it's, a, it's like a stand-in. When you can identify something that kind of is emblematic, and I didn't want to reuse that word, but um, uh, sometimes when they say, you know, an example of this word, and, um, yeah, it's it's like Scandinavian, but um, it it uh, encapsulates things in in that one instance. Uh, what's going on all over the place? I mean, for instance, that becomes a stand. The cross traffic to me, whenever I see that, I think of the, what I told you about the history of the barge traffic or the shipping up and down the river versus the railroads, and I, you know, I was thinking of that the cross purposes that they had. And so for me, that one says things that other people may or may not get, but but it's there. And that's true of probably a lot of these places and the things that I choose to depict. But we all bring to, I mean, somebody that might see your photographs might say, ah, he's got this going on that they recognize. And I think that's a great thing when somebody can bring their own experience and live through that, and you've made it evocative, or, or hopefully, um, you know, some of these too. Um, yeah. And I will think of the word. <laughs> Serendipity is a great word though. It's just the wrong one. Yeah. When I was hitchhiking, that's that was my the word that was always in my head. It's like, oh yeah, they didn't pick me up today because they were all axe murderers. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a good attitude. Yes. The Julian Dubuque River, it almost looked like you painted it from the river, but where did you actually paint that? Of the, um, the bridge. you mean yeah. across, bridge. across traffic, the bridge? Yeah. Yeah, it was just down at the uh, Zebo. Oh, okay. What, about four it's feet underwater? Like the river. <laughs> the man might feel like you're on the river. Pretty yeah. much are. Yeah, looking across over yeah. to the natural area, across the other way. Okay. Yes? I'm curious about something. Uh, I'm hearing you talk a lot about seeing. Yeah, how you see. And we share an experience. I went to SIU Carbondale, but spent a lot of time around Cahokia and all. Oh, yeah? So I'm curious about what did you see when you you were hanging out around Alton and, and that area across oh. 
Well, I have a painting from the Lock and Dam right at, it's in the show here, um, looking through the gate, the left gate, and you, you see a boat going by. That's the last lock and dam area right at, um, at Alton. But also, there's a view. I wanted to do the arch in St. Louis because I went to school, grad school, right across the river, which is where Cahokia Mounds is. And the way that I, um, there were some great views of the arch, but it's so it's so iconic. I I wanted to distance myself in certain ways from anything that was you know too done. Just like when I was in Maine, I I kind of as a matter of principle stayed away from the water, um, but which is a little ridiculous and arbitrary. But on the other hand, it made me forced me to open my eyes to other possibilities. So um, this is a painting that's not here in the show, but it. This is a close-up with the arch. You probably can't see it very well, but you're welcome to pick up this book and check it out. But this is from Cokia Mound. I'm up on the main mound, uh, looking across to St. Louis, and I very slyly titled it um, The Mound Builders. And I say that kind of tongue-in-cheek because um, I'm up on top of one of these ancient mounds from 10,000 years ago um, or so, and um, way in the corner of the painting, and people wouldn't know this unless they lived in the area or went to school nearby, but there was, uh, uh, there is, there are some of our contemporary mounds. There are, as people often call them, Mount Trashmores, and um, it just makes it into the scene here. And I, so there's this double entendre of, um, they built mounds 10,000 years ago, but we're doing our own. And it's a continuation in a way. I'm not sure for the same purposes, but there we are, we're leaving the same sort of indication that we've been here. And I don't know what that'll look like in the future, but that's um, it's a beautiful area. I mean, the whole river is. Did you ever yes. canoe past or go past the, the rock art uh, along the the, the, uh, the chain of rocks near, near all, called the Piazza Bird? Oh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's exactly. That, that you didn't see much in that. that would, well, would I didn't, you know, it's a, appeal to you're you. You're talking about a painting of a, a basically kind of a, a, a petroglyph. It's a pe well, yes, but it's not, it's contemporary, isn't it? I thought it was painted, they repaint it. It's not, yeah. it's not, but I'm it's not even sure it was historically ever there, but it is there now on a bluff wall. And that, mm, you know, I kind of did my graffiti painting on this one over here at the bridge. That's kind of what I think of it as. It's, uh, it's kind of a big graffiti thing, or a billboard of sorts, without a commercial message. But it's not something that intrinsically interested me to me. There were so many things on the river. So one just has to, there were many things that I wanted to be too, that I just really had to go by because it really wasn't, I either couldn't figure out a way into making a painting with that particular thing, or um, it was so unlike anything that I would have painted that I just couldn't imagine doing it. Um, I can't even think what the, any of those would be right now, but there's a lot. You have to ask, if any of you here, here that are artists, we get so many ideas, and then you know you can only accomplish so many of them, and you just have to pick and choose. So you're probably all tired of sitting so long. And I'll be here to um, answer any questions as long as we're open. I'm not sure how much longer. Yeah, until four. So thank you, Thomas. This is